Hi, good afternoon. Oh, it's good morning, right? Yeah. I'm so excited to be here this morning and um, be in the midst of great people. Okay, we are here to have a fantastic discussion and um, when I saw the people that I'm supposed to moderate, I was like, wow, probably the shoes I am not worthy to untie. They are great minds. He was my mate at the Kipos University. No wonder he's an elder, because we used to go to the hinterland to go and preach the gospel. But the marriage has taken me from Pentecostal. <laughs> okay. Um, Madam. Madam. Uh -huh. So we have ladies and a gentleman. Um, welcome. My name is Charlotte Nibing, and um, I will be your moderator for today. My first question, obviously, will be. Um, Recently, there has been a collapse of the, some banks and uh, financial institutions, which my institution was one of them, sadly. But you know, if you know Christ, everything is good. Amen. <laughs> I am sure we have a prophet there. Are you prophet one? Okay, so... Looking at the recent closure of the various financial institutions that we have recently, um, how do you think that regulations can redeem the image of the industry that we find ourselves? Do you think regulations can do something? Can it redeem the image and boost invest investor confidence and so the positives as well? I will ask Bridget because I'm a lady, so ladies first. So my name is Abena Brigidi. Brigidi. I know most people keep saying Bridget, Bridget, but the Brigidi is my last name. So Brigidi. Yes, yes. And thank you. And good morning to all of you. Indeed, it's been rather unfortunate, um, but it's a situation that we have no choice but we would have to repair. And to say that regulations alone would be able to fix this. I can't say so. The reason is that first we had regulations in place and the issue was, was the regulations adhered to, was the framework what it was supposed to really be, to be able to man the goalpost of what we had. If it's no, then how are we going to get these regulations in place now to be able to man the goalpost first, and two, how are we going to monitor to make sure that these regulations that are in place are held to? The reason I say that regulations alone is not able to fix it is that we've lost customer trust. And regulations alone is not able to redeem customer trust. So that means that we need to be able to build up integrity and also show some form of confidence or build some confidence for the client. How do we build this integrity? That means that the existing investment firms or finance houses that are in place should be able to display or um, work towards delivering service promise as little as even the phone call being picked the second time is run. Um, as little as I said to a client that I come in at two and two you are there as little as um, as little as if I say that I I am actually doing this investment for you, I'm doing it based on um, well informed, uh, well researched, um, well looked at, thought through, probably gone through the whole process with the client before the investment is done. Such things that are followed, the totality of it. Okay, so I'll leave it for someone else to say it, but yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think you probably asked myself whether regulations indeed can change the image. But 
But Paul, oh, what do you think? Well, thank you. Um, uh, I'm looking at the panel here. You know, a few years ago, we, we would have all men on a panel, and we kept pushing the female agenda. And it's looking like they have overtaken us. <laughs> And very soon you will hear the mantra, whatever a woman can do, a man can do. <laughs> um, uh, is regulation enough? No, I don't think so. But let's put this in perspective. What has happened is not just about bringing back confidence in our industry. Um, it's a huge blow to the economy, the entire economy. Because when you're talking about people having confidence in the industry, uh, we mobilize funds from individuals, retail, client, institutions, among other things. But when we mobilize these funds, they are invested. And they get the economy going. So, at an example, I have one fund with over 40,000 people. Somebody invested 50 cities, 100 cities. But in total, it's about 1.2, 1.3 billion cities. This money must be invested. So the money gets back into the economy, and then you get the economy running. So when you have challenges like what we have had, it's not just about people losing their jobs, but it's also about grounding the entire economy. We, we need infrastructure, you know, the, the deficit we have. So I'm just putting this into perspective that it's a huge issue we are discussing here. Can regulation alone solve the problem? I think regulation is very important in this discussion in restoring confidence. Uh, but enforcement is even more important. Yes, we have a lot of regulations, laws, among other things. The problem we have, and it's not unique to our industry, but across the country, is the enforcement. So we need to enforce, and we must be seen to be enforcing. Uh, it's not enough to set regulations to the industry practitioners. But the ordinary man on the street must know that something is happening, the enforcement is being done. But beyond that, if we want to get this running, and, and, and when it comes to ethics, uh, practically, which is the center of our discussion this morning, I, I, I think that there are about four defenses, I'll call them defenses. The defense number one, uh, is the law and then regulation. So it's just one level of faith. Beyond that is uh, where professional bodies and associations, like what we have here, comes in, where you have uh, some code of conduct for members as to what to do and what not to do. That brings about a, set, a second layer of confidence beyond just the regulation. The third defense for me will be at the corporate level. The company itself must have a definition of what we do and what we don't do. And that must be communicated clearly to the public and to their customers. And the fourth line of defense for me is the individual, the professional's own ethical standard. So I, I think that if we want to get the industry running and we want to get confidence back in the industry, we need to find a way of merging all these four areas that I've mentioned. Regulation is important, but it's definitely not enough. Thank you very much. Um, my question to Madam is, do you think that compliance with regulations alone can boost investor confidence or deposit trust? Um, thank you very much. Good morning. Definitely not. Regulation is an aspect. And if I want to take it from the point of view of public, at the first glance of it, I was like, putting ethics first. Why ethics and not the law? We made the law. The law did not make us. Something has happened. It. And all came about like the financial institutions that all came. It was regulators for, it was regulators for. But my question is, who is the regulator and what is regulations? Who is supposed to abide by the regulations and who is not? You see, it's all encompassing. We are all market participants in one way or the other. 
We did even the bank of Ghana, the governor. The governor obviously is an investor too. So whatever happens, it will affect the person. Now we are in a situation of this crisis. How do we get out of it? Remember the regulator is also affected. But to the extent that they managed to tell us the laws. And the laws cannot stand on its own. The laws obviously are made from the behaviors governing a particular uh, um, group of people. Or let's say Ghana. We have our ethical code, we have our various professions and the ethics. And like my colleagues said, what can the regulators do? Regulators are going to work hand in hand with all market participants. So the question is, to what extent can we say regulators or market participants exercise integrity in the course of doing business? To what extent can we say they objectively did their work without any bias? To what extent can we say they professionally did their work with due diligence to bring us this far? To an extent that we have to know that financial markets or a marketplace where each and every one of us is involved cannot work in isolation. And if we want a trust, I have to do my bit. Another person has to do his or her bit. Now, I feel that majority could come from the regulators because they make the law and they got to enforce it. So if air does goes contrary to the law, they should not be afraid to name, share, and that will go a long way to assist them in their supervisory roles, like the monitoring Madam Bridgeti was talking about. If a particular organization goes contrary to the law, which we all agree that it was ethical for it to be um, put in law, and you don't abide by it, you get penalized, you get shamed, you get named, and the rest would not want to fall prey. And then finally, I think that the aspect of financial institutions, both depository and non depository, the issue of depositors' insurance can build back the confidence. If I know that in this investment that I'm going into, whether risky or um, less risky, this is the level of assurance or insurance I can have, then my confidence will be built. Thank you very much. You see, we have brains here. These are great minds. Um, Abina, I want to find out, people living in Kuwait um, ethical behavior to legal behavior, that if we are within the law, confinement of the law, it's okay. What do you think? Okay. So I, I believe that legal behavior is behaviors that are set or guided by the law. Okay, so I act this way because the law asks me to do so. And ethical is based on principles, based on information, religion, um, beliefs and all morals and all these things. So I act this way because this is the way I believe it's supposed to be. Or professionally, I act this way because this is how it's supposed to be. So there's a thin line between what is ethical and really what is legal. Yeah. But really, yes. clean up, but you have the heap by you. So you sweat the room with the heap beside you. So we need, if we have swept them, then of course we need to go to the cleaners for the cleaners yes, to dispose. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Paul, you have a question. Well, I, I fully agree with um, Abana, um, except to say that regulation law must be seen to be enforced. Okay, so when you get to it. Um, the companies that went down with the repair of reports we've seen, if they are true, where are the auditors? What has happened to the auditing firms that were auditing these companies all over these years? What has happened to the directors? I mean, we have heard some have started new businesses. So, so it's, it's not just about saying that there is law, but the law must be seen 
to be enforced. But like I mentioned earlier on, it's not enough to just talk about the law. Um, and I'll really treat the fact that at the association level, these accounting companies belong to some associations. The professionals, the individuals, belong to some associations at the corporate level, at the individual level. Uh, we need all the four defenses because, you see, innovation and creativity is always ahead of regulation and law. The, normally, things will go wrong and then laws will have to come up to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And there are always gray areas that the law will not be able to cover. And I want to make it a little more practical. So you have money for investment. You want to give that money to me to invest for you, your company. But the condition is if the money is given to me, I would have to give that money to her. I will evaluate her company. I may not be too comfortable with her company, but the condition to accept the funds for investment is that it's going to end up with this person. How does the law cover that? Because we met at least and we had that conversation. So the money ends up there. Now it is time for maturity. Once the money ends there, she is paying 1% to him, to her, who is the CFO of the company or the board chairman. Out of that 1%, I also get 0.4%. So now the money matures, they cannot pay. But because I benefited, I don't have the, the moral right to go after her. And she doesn't have the moral right to ask me to go after her. So we, we, we meet and we keep thinking, and it's the poor customer's deposit. So we go and see Abuna, that look, it's getting bad, it has matured. So why don't you bring the money to me? You give her money so we can pay her and we'll reinvest so you can get your money back. So at the end of the day, there is a mess. But connivance, connivance we, we connive and it's going to be difficult for you to get the law, the law detecting this. So we are talking about the law and uh, the Director General of the Security Selection Commission. <laughs> so, Reverend, you're welcome. Yeah, so, so it, the law is important, but we need to look at the role of the professional associations and bodies. We need to look at the corporate level, all kind of um, uh, code of conduct they have at the corporate level. And for me, the most important one, is the individual's own standard. The individual as a professional, of, as a, a member of this association, who decides that I do this, I don't do this. In the worst case, I walk away. Because sometimes you can be brought under pressure to do things you think are wrong. So it's not enough to just talk about the law. Over to you, Shadow. Thank you very much. We, we just um, had the regulator entering. Reverend um, Daniel Obani uh, Tete just entered. He is the regulator for the SEC. SEC is the Security and Exchange um, Commission, right? So, Reverend, thank you for coming. He has over 20 years investment experience with Data Bank, and if you are talking about investment, then he should be the right person to be here. And now he wants the heart of a regulator. So, I don't know, it, a practitioner and a regulator, so he understands it more. Reverend, you are welcome. We understand why you are in it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> if we are Ghanaian, you would think some way. And if I was born in some other countries too, I would think some way. What do you think? Yes. Okay, yeah, um, cultural differences. Um, regional differences as well definitely has an impact on ethics. Because ethics is all about the way a group of people think, the manner in which they do things, the type of food they eat, and it goes a long way to affect the individuals. So, 
um, you will realize that whatever may pertain in Ghana may not pertain in Europe. And so I was so happy when after our problem arised, I mean the financial institutions, the regulators quickly came up with corporate governments and not going by what happened in Enron and Pamela and those other advanced countries to duplicate it for our environment because it's completely different. The way we go about things is different from how, and therefore our laws and our activities must suit what we um, pursue. Thank you very much. Reverend, I think this is, uh, since you're a Reverend Minister and Ethical Behaviors, has something to do with our own religion. I want to find out from you whether um, where we find ourselves as Ghanaians has something to do with our ethical behavior. Thank you, Charlotte, and uh, apologies for uh, coming late. I actually don't think that uh, the environment necessarily, or the culture uh, necessarily uh, makes people from uh, to ethical or ethical behavior, and, and I explain a little bit. So I think I traveled to Kuwait um, earlier on the year, and um, I think I left um, in that phone or something, and I was said, "Oh, over here, um, no one will take it." <laughs> okay. So the question is: Is it because uh, there are some rules in place? Uh, is it only because maybe it's been ingrained or inculcated in them growing up? Or there are some clear consequences for um, bad behavior such that people will not even want to go that way? I tend to think that, um, and if I take the Ghanaian, why is it that when a Ghanaian goes to UK, US, or any other part, they can? fit in, they conform, they comply, they play by the rules. But bring them back to um, uh, the dark room. Uh, whether they're, they're still hot here, I don't know. But so, so I think it's an issue of what kind of systems are in place. Uh, can people get away? Uh, can bad behavior, ethical behavior be picked up? Uh, when it's picked up, uh, is it appropriately sanctioned? Uh, so, I think it's not simply an issue of maybe the culture. In any case, I guess um, the kind of systems we put in place also impact the culture. So I, I think just to say that we are Ghanaian, so it's acceptable, I, I don't think uh, it's the way to look at it. I think it's the question of how do we put in place uh, the systems uh, you know, to ensure that people uh, stay uh, on the screen and now, I mean, when the traffic lights are working, you find people uh, complying generally. But let the um, let the uh, doomsaw or whatever cause the traffic light to go, and then pure anarchy. You know. So I think there's something inherent, and um, if we can focus on what systems we put in place, uh, I came to meet Paul talking about uh, laws. Um, if professional associations, if companies or firms, institutions, uh, you know, can't spell out what is right behavior, because I'm sure when you talk about ethical behavior, you are talking about what is right and also what is in line with uh, professional standards. That what is right, you know. So um, is it is it right to while you're on the job uh, to be preparing an application for another job? Uh, uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it right uh, you know, to use uh, some of the uh, A4 sheets uh, you know, for your own phot uh, photocopy without getting permission? Uh, what is right? Uh, some will say that every office and the privileges that go with it. But I think a clear definition of rights, privileges, and all of that will help uh, you know, to set a context for ethical behavior. But I don't think that just because we are Chinese, uh, we are bad. And actually, for all we know, some of the people in other places, if the systems are not there, they may be do worse things. Yeah. 
So, so I think maybe human nature uh, has that tendency, you know, to go up. So you need to put in place the checks and the balances. Uh, but that's quite apart from inculcating, you know, right, um, you know, moral standards or ethical values in, in people. I think that is it. But I think we lack systems here and uh, sanctions. You know, um, you know, moving into um, you know public. Uh, sector or the regulator, you, you, you get to see how when something goes wrong, uh, the kind of uh, you know, people who will be uh, assembled to come and intercede, uh, <laughs> if I can use those, uh, uh, you know, so I, I think we should, we should be focusing our conversation on how do we put in place systems to ensure that uh, we, we put ethics first. That's my submission. Thank you very much, Reverend. I want to find out from um, Abina and Paul whether they have addition to this. If not, then we move on to the next question. Do you have any additions to this? Okay, fantastic. Reverend, again, since you weren't here, we were discussing our question number one. I remember. I posed was that. Uh, looking at the collapse of the financial institution, including mine, uh, do you think regulations alone uh, can do the trick and bring the investor confidence and the investor's trust coming from a regulator? I, I wouldn't say that um, regulations would be like a silver bullet that will sort uh, this thing out. I think uh, it has to be a combination of a number of things. So yes, regulation has to be strong, and regulation has to be fair. Regulation will signal to um, investors and, the, and all stakeholders that uh, you know, there are consequences for uh, action or inaction. In, in so uh, regulation needs to be uh, fair and to send the right uh, signal. Okay. But uh, you find that people, people can always you know, find uh, a workaround uh, things and you know there can be gaps. If you take the financial sector, for instance, we have the uh, if you like the specialized units in regulating the financial sector. So we don't we don't have either a unified regulator as in one regulator or the Twin Peaks as some uh, people are proposing. So you have BUG, you have SEC, you have NIC, you have NPRA. And you have the emergence of what we call financial conglomerates that would have uh, licenses uh, you know, across any of these areas. And you, you can find that there can be some room for what we call regulatory arbitrage. Okay, so the, the, actually the, um, the creation of the uh, Financial Stability Advisory Council is to help to bring the four regulators uh, you know, closer together in terms of uh, talking because there could be gaps. I'm just saying that regulations alone wouldn't necessarily um, you know, uh, resolve the problems and help in showing up uh, investor confidence. But clearly it's an important element because people want to know that this is a regulated uh, area and the laws where there is enforcement. People want that assurance. But I think that um, you know the other stakeholders. So, for instance, if I take my area, uh, the Ghana Securities Industry Association, uh, I, I know when I, I used to be a uh, part that uh, you know, the code of uh, conduct or something like that. It, it's important for associations, uh, you know, or self-regulatory organizations to so also institute uh, some standards, okay, because. There's so much that a regulator can do. Trust me, there's so much a regulator can do. Uh, these days, we all talk about risk-based supervision because you know that um, you can't cover effectively the whole spectrum. So you want to keep your focus on uh, the flashpoint of where you know, the risks tend to be more prominent. Okay, so uh, that's why regulations alone will not uh, resolve the issues. But you need good, solid, uh, regulations and let me add that regulations that also encourage innovation in the marketplace. Uh, I, I guess because I'm coming from the, uh, the market, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that the regulator must not be seen only as a headmaster or a policeman, but 
someone who facilitates the um, the growth and development of you know, the area being regulated. So regulation must also uh, aspire to that. So for SEC in our mission that we be if I talk about to regulate, innovate, and promote the growth and development of the capital market. So um, you know we need regulation, but I think we need the um, you know professional associations where they are where applicable to also uh, you know bring uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, recently sanctioned uh, some of the auditing firms that uh, you know have audited some of the field institutions. I think some of these things uh, we should see more of it where not just the regulator but uh, SROs and various associations are demanding high standards. And then uh, I, I also think that um, we, we need to have a more educated um, you know, investor base of clients who can also demand. So for instance, uh, when, you, when you go and see a farm manager or uh, uh, any other provider, you should be able to ask some questions and get some, uh, some answers rather than just you know, uh, accept whatever you are being given, like a ticket or leave it up. So I think it's a number of pieces coming together um, you know, to achieve a restoration of investor corp confidence and strengthening of our financial sector because our financial sector is key and we need to make sure that uh, all the stakeholders we are singing from the same uh, hymn sheet so that we strengthen the uh, industry. But speaking as a regulator, we are committed to signal uh, to the market that uh, enforcement is not going to be compromised on. Uh, indeed, one of the three key elements that we identify uh, at the SDC is enforcement. So we talk about education, enforcement, and then market development. We have recently, uh, with the help of IOSCO, the International uh, Standard Center in Securities uh, Regulation, we have um, finalized our enforcement manual uh, and um, you know, we are going to go with it. So, uh, regulations have got a, a big part to play, but it is not only regulations. The, um, the uh, people working in the industry must also uh, step up to the plate. I think one of the definitions for ethical behavior also has to do with conforming with professional standards. Okay, and uh, it's something that individuals or management of firms within the various uh, sectors of the financial industry should also hold the. Thank you very much. Um, my next question is to all of you. As a person, have you ever encountered any ethical dilemmas? So probably, um, I mean, I'll start. As a person. Yeah. So I was chasing this fund and it's with uh, Power State So I go in, finally, the CFA, CFO decided that, okay, I will give you the money, but this is where the money is supposed to end. Okay, so I'm giving you the money today, but it's just to go through your books and then let it end somewhere. And this is a new company that I'm looking to go in for. I'm desperate, I'm looking for funds again to increase AUM, also get some revenue off it. So that is for me to think, is this what I would do or what I would do? Okay, and clearly it's spelled out, spelled out in Nemet. We don't do that. So we just have to let it go. So <coughs> severally I have accounted that. And in Ghana, if you need to stick to, I'm not, in, I'm not all that here, but if you need to stick to ethics, your beliefs, they kind of see you like, oh, you're the odd one out, she's not serious, um, she doesn't want money, um, she doesn't, it, maybe she has other sources of income, and all that and all that and all that. So if you stick to your ground, rather you are labeled, and rather than being celebrated or probably being clapped for or probably being encouraged, everybody kind of guns up against you and then they kind of play the ball over your head. So 
you now you cut off and you're not seeing anything. So it's very difficult. I'm sure now things have changed because people that went that route probably know that, oh, I could have stayed cool if I had stayed here this way. So I'm sure now people would learn to stay within those walls rather than probably go through that route. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh several times. <laughs> <laughs> several times. I even have one on the table right now. Yes, but you decide what to do and what not to do. And normally it has to do with individuals wanting to benefit um, out of the business they give to your company. So just like uh, Abuna said, we are giving money to you, you have to give it to a particular company. And you, you are under pressure, you have AUM targets to meet, you have revenue targets to meet. So you need to make a decision, you need to decide what you do and what you don't do. Uh, there are a few times a uh, board chairman or whoever will call you and say, look, the decision is not for me alone to take. We are a committee. And when I, after telling them that I've given the business to you, I have to go well, and shake hands. <laughs> they are not telling you anything. They are <laughs> I have to go. So you, you just decide. And for me, I don't do it. So there are a number of times you will lose businesses because of that. Uh, there was one occasion an issue came up like that. I said, I'm sorry, we can't do it. They moved their money out, and two years later, they brought it back. Yeah, so it, 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 it happens every day. I've, I've encountered that several times. Okay, the two of you are the practitioners. I don't know if you have... Um... Yes, I have a lot. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and normally, people would not expect that coming from academia... Exactly. Well. I'm surprised myself. And you can have it from various angles. And the most is coming always from our students. Um, I want to start with for management, for example. There's this issue of your professional ethics and supervisor's directive. Now, I'm a lecturer. Um, some students happen to get 48, 49. The past month is 50. <laughs> then your, your HOD complaints you ignore. Then you go to a faculty board, you ignore, you still stand by his grounds. That's no way the 49, 48 has to fail. They are final year students, and obviously. Then it finally goes to academic board, the big aspect of the committee. They come out with the directive. Please, kindly um, readjust all marks to 48 to this, for them to pass to graduate. Then you come up and ask yourself a question. We call it moderation sometimes. So that's student moderation reflect performance. This is where the dilemma you have to face. So you are in an institution, you can be alone. Now, when I relate that to my profession in ACCA, I remember I wrote um, my financial management three times. The first time I wasn't well prepared, so I knew I was going to fail. The second time, I knew I was going to be the best student. I got 48 before the third time I passed. Then normally you would see the, the, the examiners, they would give a detailed information as to those who got 48, 49, what they did wrong. And that would propel you to go and pay pounds again, prepare, sit down and do it again. And it puts us at a very good position to say, yes, I have done it. Now, from the student's perspective, I find it so difficult, and I, I normally would, would sympathize with our male um, um, counterpart. I am uh, not, trust me, I'm not going to ignite some discussions that are going on. But you see, I've been in academia for over 12 years, and deal with mature students as well. Before I got married, I said, well, this was normal. You have students coming to you, madam, you look so beautiful. Oh, madam, there are some fuel coupons, and you can get as much as 500 Ghana cities fuel coupons. So you ask yourself, I, this is a hot cake. I mean, fuel is expensive for everybody. <laughs> Should I take? Should I not take? You see others coming in the form of, excuse me to say, the, the executive director for um, SEC. Oh, please. I want to, um, you to find some 
time off and you know your course is finance, is quite technical, and my wife is struggling in your course. I want you to have a private class for her. Sometimes, trust me, the salary or the payment they're going to give is more than your salary. <laughs> so you ask yourself, if I get this opportunity and I pick it, how can I exercise my integrity? How can I exercise my objectivity? And most of the mature students, for whatever reason, some may have problems with their wives and those they just like, oh, can we go out for shopping? Can we do this? Can we? And all these are forms of harassment. <laughs> so, <laughs> in fact, when I was a coordinator, I want to um, um, just say this practical thing. There was this man who was also the working with Seth, Larry Guafo. He was a teacher at that place before he left. And so there was an encounter I, I had as a uh, coordinator. She, it was financial management. They had an IA, and only two people passed. And the man is so strict, you dare not get him in any angle. So what the class did was, they now lured the classroom and all the students mobilized at the end week to come to me to report as a coordinator that they didn't want the lecturer because the lecturer has said that all of them will fail, a whole lot of stories. Then I did my investigation and realized that all they said wasn't true and that it was rather coming from the student. Then I asked them, are lecturers tomatoes so I can go to the market and bring one and replace? Before we put somebody there, it goes through a process, department for quality, and so your, your complaints have come first, second, third week, not at. And all because the man made the statement, look, you must work for your results. And these are caliber of students, as you to say, almost all these students are very good, but for the fact that they are mothers, they are workers, they are dads, takes almost all their time. And so they don't have enough time to sit down and do their work. This is most of the drama we face every day in the out semester. To the assessor, what can I have that please, if it will take me 5,000 dollars cities for you to just pass me, I will be it. So what do you start? This is indeed, indeed. I want to find out whether there are still more areas in, in our finance and investment career, whether there are still more areas that are prone to ethical pitfalls. Yeah, from the academic point of view, I would just say that academic dishonesty. Um, and so we are able to find these tools to check the algorithm and the rest. You see somebody just went and leave somebody's project away from a different university, come and submit. Very good. The person might have even gotten an A. You just take the index number and those things. It's wonderful. But with the aid of 10, 18, and those things, as soon as you get a software, we are passing. You are able to get a student even beforehand to check those ones. But in academia, that is one of the aspects. And I don't know how this will manifest in the uh, finance situation. Okay, I'm going to. Okay, can you give it to Okay, so I think that the earlier question you asked, uh, personal uh, I, I think maybe for myself, I would say that maybe my uh, maybe my title uh, as a reverend. Yes, uh, so some things don't come. <laughs> uh, you know, people think that I, I was part of the party. <laughs> I remember. My previous life, uh, those were making a pitch for a fan, you know, and at a point the people didn't want to engage with me, even though I was the head of the asset manager. They wanted to uh, think that it's not random, but let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think maybe in a sense, certain things don't uh, come to my doorstep. But one of the things that a, a colleague told me many years ago. <clears throat> which I still use today is, excuse me, to always bring out the fact that um, certain decisions or certain things are not left to you, you know, um, the, because sometimes people want to appear more important than they, they are, or they can get certain things done. So for instance, 
um, if I should use SEC, you can't get a license just because of one individual. I, as a DG, I don't make decisions on licenses. It's a committee. But some people would, uh, would, would make a case to you that, oh, I can help you get a license. It's not true. Because you can, and I can tell you, we've gone to a committee meeting, presented it to the committee, I said, no. You know, and, and it's what it is. So I always would tell people that, look, I don't have the power. It's not dependent on me. It's a committee that will make a decision. So uh, it's not like I need you to do something for me so that I can push uh, your, your case. Because it's really um, a decision of the, of the committee. So as much as possible, uh, where it is not something that you um, make a determination, don't give the impression to people. And always let people know that this is beyond me. It is something that they're coming to so that you know, they, 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 they back off and they don't um, you know, uh, worry you. But another thing I have been doing is where I'm not sure, even till date, where I'm not sure, I will ask someone just to, because sometimes, because it's a question of what is right. Okay, so where I'm not sure, you'll bounce it off people who you, you know they have their moral compass at the right place uh, and who have experience. Just to you know, sound off and, and get some uh, other perspective because you may be looking at something from one viewpoint. You know? So that also is helpful. So I do that, I do that um, you know, all, all the time. So um, I can't cite some um, you know, uh, uh, immediate examples about some dilemmas that I have, I have been through. But I, I just try to do things that tomorrow, uh, if it's uh, brought out, I will not have to you know, bow my head in shame. I can say that I did, uh, I did the right thing. And you know, uh, where I am currently, when I, you know, I travel, for instance, and there is uh, accountable uh, impress, okay, you know, my position is that you, it's the fact that you are giving accountable doesn't mean that you have to spend it. It's only if there is the, uh, the, the, the need or what has been defined uh, by the firm. So I travel and I always bring it back intact. And, and people are wondering that, oh, this is my wife. <laughs> because my view is that if you are giving me a PDM, I should not bring with my PDM. Accountable is for what it has been set up for. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I just, you know, try to look at what is the right thing to do. I stick with it. If I'm not sure, I will bounce it off someone I trust, his or her opinion, um, and then it informs uh, me what I do. I think that, you know, the financial sector, uh, as in any other sector, there will always be room for unethical behavior. But I think that we just, to, we, we just need to sign on to uh, what the team put in ethics first, you know, to say that look, let's let's go for what is right and what is professional. Um, if we, if I take uh, our compliance manual, uh, it sets out clearly what is expected of uh, the operators. But you have a case where, let's say, um, a fund manager will sell a product that is not suitable. Uh, to the investor, just because you want to increase your AUM, you know, and uh, we've had so many complaints coming through, and you can clearly see that there was mis-selling, you know, and mis-selling is unethical behavior because you must look at the person and then, um, you know, make sure that you are selling a product that is suitable for his objective, his risk tolerance, and then whatever time horizon he has. Okay, so uh, there are so many areas that uh, within the financial space that people can, you know, get into uh, behavior that are not right. And, and I think that it's, it's up to uh, all of us, and especially those who manage the real institution, to put in place some systems and some mechanisms to uh, minimize on ethical behavior. By the end of the day, I think it's a choice that individuals have made that ethics first in all that we do. I think that is the best way to ensure that we either uh, minimize, I don't know whether we can eliminate, let's all commit to putting ethics first in all that we do. Am I
I doing the right thing? Am I complying with the right uh, professional standards? And uh, if you take the banking sector, there are standards everywhere. But people are just not uh, just not doing it. You know, so uh, it's not even for want of you know guidelines or regulations or laws, but it's for uh, people to comply uh, voluntarily. So I think that you know it's a good theme, like a good focus that you have, and we should keep talking about it. We should keep checking on each other, we should keep encouraging each other to do the right thing. Because when we do the right thing, we build uh, rights and uh, the industry will last and it will stand the test of time. Thank you very much. I think they deserve a round of applause. Okay, still in the ethical mood. I want to find out whether uh, a company can be ethical and still become profitable. Or you have to cut some corners before you become profitable. Or you should be ethical and still remain in business. I want to find out from the practitioners. Oh, yes, a company can do that. Um, I am fortunate to be working in a multinational uh, where there are clear rules of what you can do and what you cannot do. I mean, if you have to go and pay somebody, then you pay out of your pocket. Because the accounting books will not take it. Because it's not just about you signing the check and uh, uh, giving that money out. So yes, it's, it's, it's very possible. We don't do that, at least from where I sit, but we are doing our business. And sometimes people also want to, even those who want to benefit from transactions, want to deal with honest people. So once you can show that you are doing clean business, uh, there are clients who want to deal with you. So it's very possible. Um, a year or two ago, there was a company where you have a, a provident fund we wanted to manage. We had pitch for provident fund. Then the board chairman comes and says, uh, you have to pay, is it 0.5% or 1% to the trustees? So no, we, we can't do that in Echo Bank. I said, no, no, but other companies do it. I said, okay, no problem. Send your address to me. So I'm going to share this with our legal guys. They will draft an agreement. So we sign the agreement that you will be taking, then you have your account details on how the payment will be done. Say, hey, <laughs> who does that? <laughs> and that was a nice way of telling the man that we cannot do it. I just didn't want to. It love, you know. So it's very possible. It's very possible you can do clean business. You can decide not to get yourself dirty and still be profitable in business. Okay, Abina. Yeah. So I'm also fortunate to be working in a wholly Ghanaian owned company. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I think still highly ethical. Yes, very ethical. We, we don't do, we don't do kickbacks, we don't do takings, we don't do nothing. And we've been growing steadily. We've not exploded, but consistently we've been growing. Um, what I'll say is that most times, when they know that they can't talk to Abna about this, they don't even come. So from day one, you have to make your cards on the table. So they know this is what she does, this one she will do it. So don't even talk to her about it. So in the office you hear that, don't talk to her about this, she will do it. Okay. She, so from day one they know. So when one of these, camp, these banks went down, they were a custodian. And KPMG audited the company. Then it came out that our name was mentioned that we are taking money as a pension transaction. I just could not um, take it in that Nimet's name was. I just went straight to KPMG, went through that, 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 that. Then we realized that the voucher that was taken was a staff of the, the bank. So I said, can you put it on record that there was no staff? Neither was it me who took this money. And can I have it off the documents that Nimet ever took this such money? Because 1,700 Ghana cities never came to us. And we didn't do that, that, that such transaction. 
So I think that from day one, if they know, Abna will take it, Abna will pay. Or the entities won't do it. Nobody will come to you. So it's still yes, able to do that. Thank you very much. Madam from the University Gladys. Yeah, I want to add a bit from the theoretical point of view, which can, I, I would give an example to practicalize it. It is very possible. And in fact, um, we are talking about investor confidence. Everybody wants the right thing to be done. And sometimes it may come into conflict with the law. Because the law we all see is must do. But the aspect of the behavior, I mean, um, um, ethical behavior, is the ideal thing to do to save the situation. So I, I want to say that if you look at um, from the theoretical perspective, you could match the value theory with the right the theory of the right action. What do I mean by all these um, simple but confusing terms? Take for instance, um, if you are in the health services and then you have um, six people sick and you have five pills to cure those people. Now, five against six, limited resources. So it means you can only cure five. Let's further assume that one person may need all the five to survive. And then the rest may need one, one, one. What is the right action to take at that time? Remember the value chair who said that everybody must be saved. We want everybody alive. Now you can't have everybody alive because you either have to choose to give all the five pills to one and the rest die, or you give to the rest and then the one will die. What is the action to take? So, um, if you take it back to uh, maybe an industry, we could say that it's a procurement of something essential that can even cause the company's going concern. And we all know that procurement has laws. You have to take it to audit account those before signatures. Will you want to spend all that time as against the law and then do the right thing before you come back? You see, sometimes you get this situation, you get to the court, and everybody thinks that the situation is bad and that they acted ultra virus. They get the, 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 the judge may say, okay, given the circumstance, what was the right action to take? And the person goes court free. And sometimes we then those without the legal background, we begin to, you know, pounce on the court and how they are not doing things right. So I think that, yes, companies can stay ethical, but where they think that ethical will conflict with the law and they are doing the right thing, they go ahead to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Reverend Obama will ask something again. Yeah, just a, a, a little example um, you know, about unethical behavior and profitability. So the, I don't know how many of us remember, but quite a number of years ago, there was a company, I think it was a child college or so, and they advertised uh, a fruit juice, a uh, very catchy advert, fruity, 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 if, if people can remember. You know, but very catchy, but it was unethical because they said it was uh, natural. Meanwhile, it was sugar and color. <laughs> okay, so they, 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 and the question is, where are they today? They, they are gone. So the, the notion that uh, you can't be profitable if you are ethical, uh, I think it's, it's flawed. Because in actual fact, you could fool people for some time, or you could, you could escape being caught for some time, but eventually they can catch up and they can bring you down. So I think people should know that putting ethics at the center of us is important and it's also key even to sustain profitability, not just um, you, you make it once and then you go on. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, I'm told my time is almost up, right? How many minutes do we have? Five minutes. Don't worry, five minutes can do great things. So my question is, how are we preparing for an ethical future in the face of threats, challenges presented by globalization, technology, and human psychology? How are we preparing our various companies for the ethical future? 
And I think I will ask Reverend Obami, in the face of a lot of challenges with the said related entities, when people cannot redraw their money and all that, how are you preparing those companies for tomorrow? Of course, as a regulator, the first thing will be uh, putting more rules, uh, putting more uh, guidelines. So, for instance, there is a conduct of business guideline that we have worked on, and we have already bounced it off the market, and uh, we are going to issue it because that will have some uh, provisions on uh, what is expected of, of companies in terms of conducting uh, their, their business. So uh, we, we, we can talk about the framework or regulatory framework um, and then the issue of enforcement. Because when people uh, realize that uh, there's a consequence for um, you know, bad behavior, uh, that alone, you know, can you know stop you. You know, when you are doing something bad and you see a policeman, generally speaking, you may want to, uh, you know, pause. If you are going to jump the light and you see the car there, you will, uh, you know. So we, we, we are going to strengthen enforcement. But one other area which we are going to be big on is on uh, training and, and education. So uh, we are revamping the security training which currently is run by the Ghana Stock Exchange. I think uh, next month uh, the, the Institute is likely to do a launch and, and ethics is, is going to be a feature in the training program because uh, in some cases too people don't know what it is or what is right or what is ethical behavior. So um, you know we, we are going to do that training just to make sure that people at least are giving some basics and then they can uh, improve one. But I think that will urge various companies to um, uh, come up with a code of conduct, a code of ethics, just for, to ensure that their staff uh, know what is expected of them and then they do it. Are we expecting some cleanup from your sector? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We are looking at how to ensure that our sector is <laughs> Yeah, and well positioned to send the investing public better. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. Madam from Academia Gladys, I want to find out um, why should ethics be at the center of conversation? Um, Please, but, one minute. Good. I want to even add to the aspect you spoke about education. I think our educational system, um, our syllabus, should be reformed to include ethics right from aging. If it's possible throughout. I think one country has done that and corruption has come very minimal. So once everybody gets the, to know the right thing to do and the implications of doing the wrong thing, the fact that the, uh, at the back of your mind the orientation changes and so everybody will want to do everything right. But the failure to do that and then maybe you have to get to the highest level where we now have the professional bodies then you ask yourself, what about my mom at the village who possibly will not get to that level or who has not been educated? What happens? But if we start from now and then we're giving ourselves in the next 50 years and it's embedded in our educational system, it can go a long way to reduce um, the ethical, um, uh, ethical issues that we have. Okay, thank you. We have young professionals here. I want to find out from any one of you um, what should they do when they meet ethical tidiness? as young professionals? I would say that at any point in time, ask yourself, is this right? And when the chips are down, can I, think, can I raise my head up? If you can answer yes, do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I would say that uh, conduct yourself such that when you go home, you can sleep sound. <laughs> <laughs> don't, do, don't get yourself involved in anything that when you are going home, you are thinking that you this is going to backfire. Uh, there's something going to go wrong. Do it such that when you go home, you can sleep very sound. Uh, but there are also about three or four tests you can use to uh, uh, help you make a decision. One is the television set test that for what you are doing, if you are put on national television, 
to explain yourself. Will you be willing? Are you able to explain that? Number two is a family test. If you have put before your wife and your children who are in school to explain yourself on what you did, will you be able to do that? And number three is the professional test. If a panel of professionals in the industry are put together, are they going to endorse what you have done? So these are some of the tests you can uh, uh, perform when you have a, 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 a dilemma. But the ultimate one is take a decision that can make you sleep very soundly. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our last question is, what can organizations do to help individuals or young people find their voices when they are promoting ethical behaviors and integrity in their workplace? Okay, I'll simply say they should walk the talk. Once you walk the talk, everybody also wants to walk the talk. Be an example yourself. Then besides that, I'm just adding to what they have said. I mean, to all the procedures, you can also encourage whistleblowing. And uh, so somebody, you are pushed to the point and you have no option, you go and report. I was supposed to do this and I said it's not the best, but I think it can help. Thank you Thank very you. much. Um, Reverend Obama, do you have any closing remarks? Well, I just add that I think it's important to reward, uh, recognize and reward ethical behavior. So we should think of what we can institute in our various uh, institutions, companies, firms that will recognize and then reward. When people re realize that, um, you know, that is happening, they will be encouraged. And also, when we allow uh, whistleblowing, let's have mechanisms to protect uh, the, the people. I, I think when we do that, we reinforce uh, the drive to ethical behavior. Uh, look, Warren Buffett said something and it guides me. He says when you are recruiting, when companies are recruiting, there are three things they need to look out for. Intelligent young people, people who have passion and who have high drive, and no matter people who have integrity. I said the worst employee you can have is the one who is intelligent, who has high drive, but who does not have integrity. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor is now open for Q&A. Questions and answers. We will take about five questions and we will move on. Okay, so we take our first set of questions. Yes. All right, thank you very much. My name is Edwin Zuman. Um, so there's a two-in-one question there. Um, I want to direct the first one to Reverend. Um, I think that one of the, um, should I say, stakeholders that received, or is still receiving lots of passion because of the pandemonium in the financial services sector, especially the uh, banking subsector, I mean, has been the regulator. And uh, people are talking about the fact that if the regulator has done their work well, you know, things wouldn't have gone that way. So um, let me look at what I'm saying. Um, have to come and check and then eventually certify that officially the branch can work. That is what happens. So one early morning I was called, I had to rush from the house you know, and get to the office. So I stood there, I was there waiting and the person came uh, in the V8 and so the driver stopped there and the woman got out and came. I said, oh, man, how are you? Fine. And I led her to the branch. We entered and she just walked three steps and looked at the corner and the other corner. Oh, good. That's fine. Did they ever tell you something? I said, yes, this is it. And then look and then I came. That was it. Wow. I said, wow. So is that all about it? Then I can also work there because it's so easier for me to do that. Um, the question I want to pose is this. We expect the regulator to be the watchman. And so if things don't go well, we go back to hit the watchman. I mean, some of us, because of the stance we took in these ways, we have to even suffer. So, because of that, okay, they will move you from this branch to another one because you are too troublesome. You don't allow certain things to happen. The watchman, the regulator, my question to you, Reverend, is who watches over the watchman? <laughs> I said to you, man. The next question is, who? Mr. Paul, um, it's very simple and straightforward. Do you think that confidence in clients? Our investors can ever come back after this pandemonium? Can it ever come back 
Are we going to have a full blown, you know, something like we used to have in the past? If not, why not? What do we do? If yes, when is it going to come? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I saw I come here. Okay, thank you very much. My name is George Anna. And uh, in the beginning of the presentation, I think um, Mr. Mante mentioned key lines of defense when it comes to ethics. We mentioned the industry, professional bodies, the corporate institutions, as well as the individual. But it's something I also want to throw in, uh, given we are Ghanaians. You know, Ghana has a, a strong affinity towards religion, with Christianity and uh, Islam being the dominant the dominant sex in Ghana. Could we say that this could also be a line of defense, but most likely it's also failing? Because you see a lot of churches. If we had to take a Sunday, there will not be traffic on our roads. Where is everyone? Most of us will be in churches. Fridays in the afternoon, some of us will be in the mosque. Could that be a line of defense, or and we are doing something very wrong? So the same people are in corporations but we are quick to blame the regulator. When it comes to regulation, it's because there, is, there are punitive measures, like uh, the Director General rightly mentioned, there are punitive measures. But ethics goes beyond regulation. Ethics is a little above the law, because the law can have gray areas. The law can have a place where the law is not explicit, and there are no punitive measures. Will you still do what you are doing? So I just want to throw it in something we can discuss that. Why are we going to, on Sundays? Where are we going on Fridays? When Monday to Friday we are doing something else? Thank you very much. I saw a man here. I'll move there. And, uh, sorry, I can't be fair on this, this particular uh, segment of the program. So, yes. Good afternoon. Um, this to Reverend as well. Um, let's say that I went to the bathroom to bath. Okay, so I want to clean my body and then I wash half of the body and the other half is left. I come out of the bathroom and I still stinks because the other half is still not washed. I'm told that the uh, financial industry has been cleaned, but then half of the sector is being cleaned. How do I not convince another customer who has money with a segregated company to still give money to another institution that has been cleaned? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Reverend has, I think, about three questions now. Let me. Hi. My name is Patrick. So, with the, with the issue of ethics, I believe it's because of the human face. The future of ethics, is there any way we can incorporate artificial intelligence or machine learning so that we can check the issue about ethics? If yes, how? Thank you. Yes, yes, so uh, we have a couple of questions now. And um, yeah, so Reverend had about three questions. Um, I hope Reverend will take those questions for us. Thank so, you for the questions. Who watches the regulator? Yes. I had to want to say God. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, um, I can talk about the fact that we have a, a code of conduct um, that um, we expect all employees of the regulator, for instance, to sign to indicate that uh, they are going to abide by it. But as you know, signing um, the paper in itself or being made aware uh, of the code in itself doesn't mean that people will comply. So I think the same things we talked about in terms of uh, monitoring and, and when we find behavior that is uh, wrong to apply the right sanctions, okay? And I think it's important, I, I don't know what you did uh, at the time in the case you cited or what you knew you could have done, but I think some of these things, when it comes up, uh, you know, because it, it will typically happen on the blind side of, let's say, senior management or executive management. So, uh, if there are ways in which it can be uh, excavated, you know, then some action can be taken. But uh, it definitely is a challenge. It, it's a human institution. 
uh, they are human beings uh, working uh, in the uh, you know so some of these things um, you know are likely to happen. But I think the commitment of uh, any leadership should be to continually push the ethics agenda. And you do it by recognizing, by punishing, and so on and so forth. And also even training. Uh, so we'll continue to do that. But in terms of accountability, um, you know, there are various uh, organs that uh, are established within the public sector. For instance, the public accounts uh, committees, you know, and uh, the finance committee. I mean, I have had to appear on uh, both of them, you know, for things that happened even before I got into the current position because is an institution that has been invited. So I think there are some institutions that uh, can hold people accountable. But some of the things that show up the agenda of ethical behavior and you know you monitor it and make sure that uh, it's it's uh, dealt with. Um, maybe I'll comment on the um, the gentleman who talked about the fact that whether religion can also be a line of defense and whether it has failed. Um, in my church, I always tell the people that uh, the church is a soul clinic. Uh, soul clinic in the sense that people come there for help. Okay, so the fact that there are people who come to church and uh, they go out and they may do one or two things, doesn't mean that coming to church or the mosque, uh, for that matter, uh, is not being effective. They are coming because they have a need. So we'll continue to work on them, you know, and hopefully. Uh, there will be a change because people come, um, you know, because they, they need some, some some help and some guidance. So I, I, I subscribe to the viewpoint that it can be another line of defense, um, uh, but we, we can't expect that just because people go to church or they go to the mosque, immediately they'll be transformed. It, it, it will take some time for lives or values to be inculcated. So, but it can be a line of defense. That's my. Uh, view and then um, I was in a certain program the lady who used the analogy of uh, taking a bath and then uh, uh, bathing one part and leaving the other. I was in a certain forum and you know this issue of uh, Bank of Ghana uh, indicating that they have, they have finished the cleanup uh, came up and I my view was that you can you can never really say you have finished the cleanup um, uh, maybe the skill uh, that this occurred was significant, so it was called uh, a cleanup. But um, you know, don't be surprised uh, if uh, you know further down the line, you uh, something comes up. Actually, if you read out, you know that in the developed economy, the U.S., Canada, every year banks are failing, the financial institutions are failing. So. Um, it's not an issue of saying that uh, we have finished the, the cleanup. We can never finish uh, cleanup in a certain sense, but an important intervention has been uh, conducted by uh, the, uh, the Bank of Ghana. Uh, but on the continued basis, we'll, we'll have to continue monitoring uh, to make sure that people stay on the street and narrow. Uh, same with SEC, we are looking at uh, our, our sector and we are, we are looking at ways in which we can ensure that the, uh, the operators within our sector uh, are also uh, doing the right thing. Uh, some, I can confirm, have done um, you know, wrong things. For instance, we have, uh, last year, June, we came out clearly to say that uh, firms licensed by SEC cannot, should not, must not issue uh, guaranteed returns. Okay, we, we, we were very clear. That has actually been there, but we came out strongly to enforce it and we gave out that uh, directive. But we know some people prior to that directive uh, were doing that. And even post that directive, you know, because some information has, we've picked up some information, we show that some uh, uh, people are still doing it. So it, it's an issue of the regulator. Um, we keeping an eye on the ball and making sure that um, we we are having you know sound uh, compliant uh, operators within the uh, within the industry. So um, we are committed. At least I think 
whatever has happened so far is an indication that regulation will step up to the plate. And uh, I can say from my part that we also committed that we'll do what we need to do to ensure that we have strong and healthy um, uh, firms operating in the financial sector. Yes, um, so the question was, would confidence ever be restored? Yes, I think that it's going to take time for it to happen. Um, in 2015 or so, I, I went looking for some business, that a lot of money, close to 100 million. And this uh, client said, I won't fix the faucet. If you cannot fix the faucet for us, we are sorry, because we are getting a fixed rate. So I'm not a deposit taking company. Our license does not allow us to do fixed deposit. And we can't guarantee you a return. So we lost that client. But you know what? That money is locked up in the challenges we have at the moment. <laughs> so I met a client last week. He said, look, I've learned lessons out of the mess. So take this check and let's go and start. Kakra Kakra will build up. <laughs> so I think what has happened, people have also learned lessons. Um, and the companies, so on the church being another defense, there are a number of people doing the right things. So let's not make it appear as if all the companies are not ethical. There are a number of companies in our industry at the moment who are doing the right things. So I think people have learned who will continue with the public education. Uh, with all the things SEC are doing, and uh, if we are able to look at all the other defenses that I mentioned earlier on, it's gradual, but I think that we'll get it. Okay, a round of applause. Great, so we'll go for our next set of questions. Five questions. Uh, let me see by hand those who have questions. So, one, two, Three, four, okay, five, six, and there was another one here. Seven. So these are all the questions we're going to take. So can you take your numbers? One, two, three, four, five, six, and there was a seven. Okay. So we we'll take only seven questions, and then we are done. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Clement Samuel. Um, my question goes to the four of you. I don't know who will be responsible because I think in all the submissions, there's one thing that is missing. And what is missing is who is responsible. In all the institutions, we shy away from responsibility. The cleanup that was done. The financial sector is still struggling. I've been affected because my institution has been closed. I asked, these institutions submit reports, potential reports, weekly, monthly, to the regulators. They receive them. Do they review them? Do they visit them? Do they get back to them on the reports that they receive? What is right and what is wrong in those reports? It will surprise you to know, which I don't think the panels will be surprised as a regulator because you receive the same report in month one as in October, same report is submitted to you in November. The only thing that changes is the dates, but the figures remain the same. But you accept them, keep them in your office. I want to ask, is it for somebody to pay for your irresponsibility or your act of negligence to do due diligence to the reports or the duties you are supposed to carry out as a regulator, that you shut them down to cover up for what you've not been able to do as a regulator, or you are really, really playing the ethical role to say you are being responsible, so you are shutting them down. What gets inspected gets done. And the regulators, I want to know if that is what is happening, 
or if that is what you have done, or truly you really got to work and you have found these institutions not functioning, so they have to be shuttered. I want to know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Nathan Kuoye, and I have two questions. The first one goes to all of you. And it's about the last few weeks a lot of rioting and demonstrations in countries like Chile and India. Where citizens complain of a lack of liquidity and central banks have put a limit on amounts that people can actually withdraw. And about 20 different central banks are ejecting new money into their various economies to provide stimulus for economic growth. Now my question is, are all these events isolated necessities or they are signaling a greater global problem? My second question goes to the Director General of the SDC. Now we are in a rapidly evolving world where the nature of finance is changing and new forms of alternative payments like cryptocurrencies are coming into the picture. What is the regulator doing? for such new innovations to thrive in the Canadian economy. Thank you. My name is Maxwell. We are discussing professional ethics. So what I would like to ask. What I would like to ask is that will our professional development automatically develop our ethics? If not so, what can we do that our develop our professional development will complement our ethical behavior? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Franklin Rose Century. Um, I would like to ask this question about uh, how well is corporate governance? being implemented in our organizations and uh, as regulator and um, to what extent are you ensuring that they are being implemented well? Um, Director General gave an example that um, when there is a committee that grants license and he has nothing to do with that personally. Fortunately if if if, if this what is being done then that's good but in a situation where the director general, for example, is among those who appoint the committee members, then you realize that there will be a problem. We cannot leave trust to, 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 to people. That's why we have controls. So the control, what would be the control here? Uh, is to ensure that the person who appoints them doesn't sit with them, so that it doesn't exercise influence. This is the question I want to ask that uh, how are we supervising how um, corporate partners are also being implemented, the committees that work, how independent are they in taking the decisions that are critical to the life of the organizations? Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I have to end the Q&A here. But then before I get to the panel, um, I think the first part, there was a question that wasn't answered. It was about the vocation of artificial intelligence. Is that right? Great. So. Uh, Mr. Mante, or who, who picked that question? Okay. Who did you direct the question to? Academia. Academia. Oh, okay, okay, great. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. I think with um, artificial intelligence, um, some of our CCTVs can, you know, come a long way to answer it. All organizations have, and within the organizations, you are acting, and you seem to be acting. That solves the problem. I can give a very simple example. Working with mobile phones, um, my partner happens to be a self employed person. And that was eating up into the business. They come and they are all over ourselves, blah, blah, blah. Then he said, Please, I want all of you to put aside your phone when you come. You can only use it during your break time or after work. It's still persistent. And so he put in the CCTV, whether he's there, he's not there, and lateness, the issue is solved. 
He's at home and he's on the phone and he calls, please, um, this person, this person, this person is not there. When they come, we tell them, I mean the supervisor, tell them to go back. And they're not paid for that day. So before eight, they are all there. So that is an aspect of it that can um, assess. I don't know if somebody has something to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that there's another aspect that is gradually coming into the system. Especially, um, one is credit scoring, where we have information being entered into systems and systems taking over the information that's on. So now we don't need, um, say, Mr. Koyoku to sit down and score Mr. A for a facility that probably he's not entitled to, that he will need a kickback for. But the system has already scored you, and we know that the system doesn't have the capacity to receive any kickback. So gradually, it's going to grow into some other industry that we are anticipating, we don't know yet. But gradually, it's coming into the system. I hope that answers your question. It does, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to attempt to answer the gentleman question, who, as who is responsible. I think to a greater extent, we are all responsible, not only the regulator. Because to the extent that even the regulator comes, it's what you give the regulator that would he or he would act on. I'm saying this from experience. I was in the banking system for um, four years. And I left the banking system for just two reasons. One, one of them I had a very critical, uh, was at a very critical department, that was audit. And every time I did my audit report, it was altered even before it went to a meeting. Every time. So even if you go to them, my name is still embedded in that particular bank because most of those I went with who are still there, they always call me uh, Mami Jaka, how are you? <laughs> that I am always, I will not change it. I left because of one reason. The second reason was also because I felt I needed more time. Sometimes I had to travel out and that. So today, if I were still there and the interest was there, you know what I would do? There was a person that, as who watches the watchman, you are supposed to also watch the watchman. Whichever way that you have to go, even if it takes you to go and pitch media and say, please hide my identity, this is what is happening in my company, they will pick it up. Because at the end of the day, you see you are a victim. Not only that, the growth of uh, the economy, most times the financial sector is a major contributor to GDP. Now most of them are collapsing. What happens? We are all crying. So I think that we all have to, we are all responsible in a little way. And it will go a long way to change the whole um, issue. Thank you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I sincerely believe that, uh, you know, indeed we are responsible. You know, when things happen, people always look for someone to blame. And I, I personally, uh, I, I don't like that, that mindset. I always ask that, what could you also have done? Or what is your responsibility in it? Everybody, you know, is contributing one way or the other. So I think it's always good to uh, face up, you know, to our own responsibility. When it comes to the shutting down of um, a bank or an SEI, um, the act is clear at 930. When certain things are there or when certain things happen, you know, the word you use is shall. And if, if, you, if the lawyers here will tell you that when shall is used, it means that it has to happen. The fact that maybe it wasn't done in, uh, in previous times, it's, it's a different conversation. But if conditions happen that merits that uh, this provision the act must apply, I think that that's what happens. Yes, um, you know, returns are, are, are submitted um, and, you know, uh, analyzed or supposed to be analyzed. And uh, they are supposed to throw up and early uh, warning signals and all of that. Probably, yes, we can say uh, the regulators can do, um, can
can do better in terms of analysis of the, uh, the returns that um, you know, are submitted and so on and so forth. Um, but you know, sometimes, uh, like I think the questioner uh, posed, you find that people submit you know, um, data that is uh, incorrect. And I'll give an example. So we wrote to our farm managers that they should give us their exposures to the SDIs and microfinance institutions. Okay. Uh, we had data, but we wanted a confirmation okay, of the exposure. And we said, give us the data as at the end of March 2019. Okay. Now, when the data came, uh, and I compared it to data that we have received from the same farm managers as at uh, December 2018. The figure in 29, March 2019 was into the uh, data of the system of our licenses and pick data. So when people have to submit, whether it's submitted electronically or manually, they can always, like the lady said, by the time the report gets to the destination, it could have been, um, you know, modified. You know, so we, we have learned lessons and we are going to look at ways in which we can strengthen uh, the, the supervision in terms of uh, receiving of information, analysis, and then the action uh, that we, we take from it. So that's uh, my uh, response to the, the first question. And then there was a question about, uh, you know, like the digital currencies or the, um, the crypto uh, currencies coming up. Um, we, we are aware that there are people here who already are, um, you know, uh, dealing in it. Um, we, we issued a, a, a notice to say that we currently do not have any regulations on uh, crypto assets. So if you, um, if you participate in it and then something goes wrong, uh, we, are, we are saying that you are on your own because it's currently not regulated because that is what it is. It, it's an emerging area. We are not averse to it. We are aware of the fact that uh, we need to see what to put in place for that era. But one of the things I like saying is that, you know, if you're a regulator, you can't regulate what you don't understand. So you must first understand it, and then you can put in place um, in the right um, framework uh, you know, for that. So in terms of what we are doing, um, we are trying to um, you know, wrap our minds around in terms of what uh, it is. I can tell you that IOSCO, which is our um, the international uh, body, uh, you know, the, the position of IOSCO is that um, you know, members, members should um, issue uh, guidance notes to the, the various markets that, well, this is an area is emerging and um, until there are clear regulations in place, uh, people need to be aware of the risk that they are taking. There are people who have lost money uh, going into it. Indeed, with investment, you can lose money depending on the risk that you take. But we are not against it. All we have said so far is that we, don't, we do not have uh, regulations as we speak. So we can't uh, give anybody any license, okay? The thing is that for now, quite a, a number of the people who are even offering, you know, the, um, the crypto assets locally or uh, within our country, you find that they are doing it uh, online. So, you know, the question is, if, it, where, if you want to go to their office, where, where, where would you go to do inspection and, and all of that? You know, so there are quite a number of nuances with it. So we want to make sure that we put in place a framework that makes sense and that will support it. But we are not against innovation. We are not against uh, uh, you know, the, the trend to fintech and all the uh, digital uh, currencies. Actually, one of the things that we have put in place to show that we uh, support uh, innovation in the market, that we have introduced what we call the regulatory sandbox license, which is a mechanism to uh, accommodate uh, instruments or products that either we don't have existing regulations or the regulations are not deep enough. Okay, so 
you can put it through the sandbox and then uh, after a while work out the, uh, the, the, the regulation. But in terms of the crypto space, what we are doing is we want to get um, a better hand on it and then come up with uh, the right regulatory framework uh, to regulate it. So uh, actually I've been receiving a few uh, proposals of people who want to come and then uh, help uh, that there's a professor, uh, I think in Kenya, who, who has helped them do some training. So, so, so we are not averse, but I'm, all I'm saying is that we don't have regulations for now. So if you don't have regulations, there's nothing we can do from the standpoint of uh, a regulator, but it's not like we are against it. Um, in terms of uh, corporate governance, uh, how do we uh, supervise, uh, like I said, we have come up with a corporate uh, governance code for listed companies, and then we also have the conduct of business for the um, our operators. Now, in these uh, codes, there are various uh, things that we have provisioned and put in that would ensure, for instance, the independence of uh, the board. We insist uh, not just on the fit and proper test, but your, your board members, for instance, must be independent. And we are not talking about non-executive, but independent non-executive, because being non-executive will not necessarily mean you are independent. Okay, so those are some um, mechanisms that we are putting in place. But at, at the SEC level, uh, the composition of the board or the committees is not at any individual's discretion. It's actually defined. I came late because I was in an audit committee meeting of the commission. And the members are specified and they are appointed you know, from various uh, entities, okay? Uh, the executives who are there, uh, we are there because we are executive, but, and, and the chairman is not even a member of the board of the commission. The chairman, according uh, by law, is, uh, uh, must be appointed from the external uh, reps that have been uh, designated by law who are on the board. So, um, the, the, in terms of the ensuring that it's independent, these are some of the checks and, and balances that are in place. I think those were the questions that were, were directed at me. Okay, so I'll pick uh, whether professional development automatically develop our ethics. No, I think it's the starting point. So we need to continually educate ourselves and develop ourselves. Um, if, I'm sure very soon you hear that even for those of us who are set licensed, you would have to go through some professional development. So it's not a situation where you get your license and it ends there. And I want to connect that to the, his question on who watches the regulator. Um, and we say that if all the four uh, levels of defense can work for us, so it's not just a regulator. So that is just one layer. The law and regulation is one layer. The professional bodies and associations it's another layer. And the company itself. So the company sending the wrong report to the regulator. The company has a line of defense. So if the company is doing the right thing, then the wrong information does not even go to the regulator. And the fourth level of defense is you, the professional. Like she said, the worst case, you walk away. You know, you can change jobs, but you can't change your reputation. You, you, you can't do that, but you can change us. So, that is one of the things uh, somebody said that imagine life as uh, a game in which you are juggling some five balls. You name them family, health, friends, and spirit. Uh, family, friends, spirit, and work. Five. The, the, set the four. Your relationship with family, health, your friends, your spiritual life, or your integrity. They are like last balls. If they drop, they will, will be able to work out this cap. But work is right, like a rubber ball. When you drop it, it will bounce back. You can change jobs, but you can't change your reputation. So the individual, I believe, is the most important line of defense. If the companies that have challenges, if we had some individuals who stood for the right ethics, they could have whistled blow and told the regulator that this is wrong. Or this report we keep sending, it's the same report, we haven't changed anything. 
And that is not to say that we shouldn't hold the regulator accountable, but that is, is to say that we all have a part to play. And if the four lines of defense can work together, we can restore confidence and what happens will not happen again. Thank you very much. We'll bring this section to a close. I want to say a big thank you to Gladys, Paul, Abena, and Reverend Obami for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. We've had an interesting and great night this day. God bless you. Okay.